Hello and welcome to the next session in today's Banking Revolution event brought to you by the Financial Times. My name is Owen Walker. I'm European Banking Correspondent at the Financial Times. Um, and this in this panel, we'll be focusing on how technology can increase access to financial services. Um, now, given the pace of technological change in finance in recent years, uh, this really feels like an opportune time to really delve into this topic. And to step back and think about um, to what degree uh, that development has helped bridge financial inclusion gaps and transform lives, but at the same time to consider whether those uh, without access to technology are at risk of being left behind and, and what can be done about that. Now, before we begin, uh, I'd like to remind you all that you can submit questions to the panel throughout uh, by using the Q&A box uh, on your screen. Uh, just to the right hand side uh, and we would also encourage you to share your thoughts and tweets about the event uh, on social media using the hashtag banking revolution uh, and now on to the panel um, first we have Sujata Bhatia who is chief operations officer at uh, Monzo the UK online bank uh, next we have Sebastien de Brewer who is chief policy officer at the European Banking Federation uh, we're also joined by Claire Sibthorpe, who is Head of Connected Women and Connected Society at GSMA, the, which represents interests of the mobile network operators. And finally, we have Melissa Stevens, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Digital Officer at Fifth Third Bank, uh, the US consumer lender. Uh, welcome to all. Thanks very much for, for joining me today. I'd like to um, to start by asking you each the same question uh, and to really kind of frame the discussion we'll be having over the next um, 35, 40 minutes or so. Um, and I'd like to ask each of you, um, what in your opinion, which, which technological change over the past five years has had the biggest impact on uh, financial inclusion? And um, Sujata, uh, maybe start with you, please. Sure. Um, I'm probably biased and you'll get that in my message, which is I think the digitalization of money is having the biggest impact um, in the, uh, the pandemic obviously accelerated that adoption. There's so many barriers to inclusion and they range from geographic to demographic to socioeconomic and I think technology creates the opportunity to address those barriers, you know, remove the inherent bias and create access to those underserved populations at scale. And, now it feels like the right time for that impact to be felt. You know, we've just recently crossed the threshold where over 50% of the world's population are now mobile internet users, and 94% of the world's population now has broadband coverage, and that's accelerating its pace. So it feels like the conditions are right for this to take hold. That's great. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. Well, I think beyond the uh, a, a widespread uh, access to the internet, uh, I would say there is one no no one response to, to the question. I, I believe it's very much depending on where you are located in, in, in the world. So your geographical uh, location, but also the level of inclusion exclusion already existing in, 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 in that part of the world. And which also depends of the, um, I mean, the development of the um, financial infra infrastructure in that part of the world. So what is clear is that indeed technology has played a, an essential role. But if you look in Africa, it might be more the mobile uh, technology. In China, it's more platform um, with uh, mobile interface. In India, actually, you have had the um, some development in really in the foundation infrastructure uh, with uh, initiative like the uh, uh, digital identity, which allowed actually uh, millions of Indians to open a bank account. Um, so it depends very much, I would say. But digital is, of course, a key aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Claire, maybe your thoughts. Yeah, I guess, um, so I, I agree with what's been said, but I, I would probably, no surprise, I'm going to say mobile, because um, I think, you know, most people in the world now have a mobile phone. It's the it's a device that's most affordable and accessible to people. Um, most people access the internet um, now on the mobile phone and mobile money as a service, you know, as Sebastian mentioned, for example, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the latest FinDEX data shows that it's, it is, um, 
you know, providing financial, driving financial inclusion more than any other financial institution. So um, I think it's just addressing some of the barriers of those who are currently not served um, in many different ways. And it go and it's and I would say in the you asked about the last five years, it's going beyond just sort of sending and receiving money. You know, we're seeing you know people are saving, paying bills, credit insurance, the whole range of platforms and services are now being offered through these technologies, which is really expanding financial inclusion in a very meaningful way. Great, thank you. And, and finally, Melissa. Thanks. I I would actually piggyback on on what Claire said. I I and I agree with Sebastian and Sujata. When you look at what mobile networks and the connectivity that is now available to, to folks, that is you know bringing a, a more equal playing field. But really, as Sebastian said, it's so different in so many places. And so I I think the advance of the mobile networks, the connectivity and broad, broadband is huge. I do also think actually it depends on lots of companies, not just in banking, to focus on local communities and economic development in them because we have to be careful that it's access to all and not actually creating a larger divide. And so while now we're evening um, the foundation, it really makes a difference the way that we reach out, the way that we decision on microfinance needs and, and borrowing uh, for people so they can build up the actual financial means that they need so they can build their businesses, build their individual uh, savings, as Claire said, and, and have, have more equal access. So to me, it's the foundation from a tax standpoint. Now we've all got to partner together to have better economic development and economic inclusion. That's great. I mean, some really interesting um, points you've all raised there, and I think lots of things that we can we can, we can really delve into um, throughout the rest of the session. Um, Claire, I wanted to come uh, and, and ask you a little bit about your work in terms of bridging gender gaps. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about you know who, you know who's being left behind um, in a digital world? What are the kind of barriers that need to be addressed, uh, and, and where and where you're seeing kind of uh, you know, certainly in your field, that what are the mobile operators doing? Uh, you know, obviously they're increasing digitalization, um, but what is that? What, what efforts are they doing to to um, increase uh, inclusion for women? Okay, no, thanks for that. Every year we do a uh, we do a extensive research, sort of nationally representative surveys to find out what is the state of digital inclusion, what is the mobile gender gap, um, and what we're seeing is that you know there is a significant gender gap, not just in ownership. Um, in mobile internet and mobile money, you know, mobile money services, but that the it's sort of we look mainly at low and middle income countries where the gaps are biggest. Um, it's it's you know women are are now sixteen percent less likely than men um, to use mobile internet, and the gaps are biggest in South Asia and Sub Saharan Africa. What I think is quite alarming is that we've been tracking this data over a number of years, and we've seen the the gender gap reducing each year on mobile internet, but this year for the very first time we saw that it stalled. Um, so I think what we're seeing is that COVID is disproportionately negatively impacting um, women and some of the poor, poor groups. Um, so we see that gaps are biggest amongst women, uh, people who have lower education, lower income, um, things like that. So I think what we're so I think what's worrying uh, about the, the latest data is that um, is that it is, you know, people who are most uh, financially excluded are also the ones who are being most disproportionately impacted. And these gaps, which had been reducing, have stalled certainly on the gender side. Um, and we looked at what are the barriers and the top barriers are coming, you know, people aren't aware of these services, um, but they're also, um, once they're aware of the services and you know have a phone, um, then the biggest barriers are uh, handset ownership, cost of handsets, literacy and digital skills comes out also as a top barrier. Um, you know, obviously this is all played. You know, social norms and structural inequalities between men and women play out, but sort of yeah, safety and security issues can be a concern as well, and um, access issues. But mainly the top ones are affordability and literacy and skills um, in in our research. So I mean, the operators are taking. Um, a number of actions to do it. So one thing, I mean, I strongly believe that we need to have targets and set to ourselves targets if we're going to address this. So mobile operators have signed up to something called the Connected Women Commitment Initiative, where they've set bold targets to reduce the gender gap in their customer bases with numbers, and they and they report against those numbers. And then they're doing things like, um, you know, having lower cost handsets, having uh, financial access. Um, uh, financial access to, to handsets, literacy and skills initiatives, uh, training, having female agents to make it more accessible to women, you know, having products and services that are relevant to the women in their particular customer bases. So a whole range of activities to address the different different barriers. And they are making a difference. We're seeing, you know, they've now reached, since this initiative was launched in 2016, they've reached over 55 million women. And in the context of a, a gender gap that's stalling and in some countries widening, you know, they are 
you know, these sort of targeted informed actions are making a difference. So I would just, you know, we need good data, we need targeted um, effort, and we need to be focusing on the barriers and all the barriers, not just one of them, but a holistic approach to the different barriers that women face. Okay, that's great. And it'd be really fascinating, um, Sajata and, and Melissa, to hear about it from your bank's perspectives, you know, uh, and, and in the UK and in the US, what, what sort of experience you are seeing in terms of, of gender gaps and being bridged and maybe how your, your business is doing it or, or are the best practices you may have seen in the industry? Uh, sure. Why don't I go first? I mean, I think just to step back, you know, participation in the financial system is, you know, one of the great equalizers and the biggest opportunity to level up. And we know that money is one of the few things that can have intergenerational impact. A parent that can learn to manage their money better and make progress can impact their children and their grandchildren. And now we more than ever, as we face a generational cost of living crisis, customers need more visibility, control, and empowerment over their finances. But perhaps piggybacking off of so what Claire said, you know, we know, for example, in the UK, the average reading age is nine years old. And so it doesn't mean the intelligent age is nine years old. It is the reading comprehension age. And, you know, there we know a lot of people have English as a second language or other barriers to literacy that Claire referenced. So one of the first things you can do is really demystify finance and take away some of the, the pieces that make it feel prohibitive using incredibly simple language. We work really hard to avoid jargon and be warm and thoughtful in everything we say, reduce the anxiety that surrounds money. I think that's you know one critical area before you get to the fact that once you've demystified it and made it simple, you have to build tools that give people real control and transparency over their money and really help them make financial progress. Um, you know, that's important for everyone, particularly from a gender perspective, and maybe later we can talk about some of the other underserved segments that that can apply to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Melissa. Yeah, uh, building on that, I, I do I do think it starts it starts with the youth. And actually, it, in, in America, what's interesting is we don't teach a lot about how to handle your banking uh, when you are growing up and in the education system. We certainly teach math and algebra and things of that nature. So a lot of the banks, us included, focus a lot on programs that we bring into the schools and bring into communities. Uh, for Fifth Third, we actually have something called the eBus, which we bring into essentially what banking deserts around our footprint to actually educate local community, to give them access uh, to the internet if they, if they need it, to help them get um, the basics of education about what it is to save money, have a checking account, build things up. And then we bring programs called the Young Bankers, uh, both virtually uh, now from COVID as well as in person into the into the schools to teach them uh, and to teach different students of all ages, starting in primary school up through high school, uh, the basics of it. And as Sujata said, really demystify it and make it not as anxiety provoking, especially if you come from a situation where you haven't had access to even small bits of short, you know, of, of liquidity to help you buy something a little bit special. And so really focusing first on that simplification, not oversimplification, but really simplification from an access to information and trying to and trying to bring that down. And then we work really hard to bring more tools uh, and, and products to life that allow people to have access to their own money early. Um, and to make sure that they understand the decisions they're making when they have to borrow uh, at, at different rates. So I think it's an all in play. And the more it's similar to in the UK and to other parts of the world, the, the literacy level in the US is, is a lower age level um, than where people get through education. So the more we can do to help people have the same baseline information, the same common way of talking, um, we appropriately have a lot of regulations, but we overuse um, that is an excuse uh, to actually jargonize a lot of the way that we talk about things. And that is not a regulation or a compliance thing. That is an obligation to us to disclose the information necessary, but in a way that's accessible. If you get on a mobile um, you know, site or on an app and you see this much about the product and then scrolling to tomes of words that you don't understand about the terms and conditions, that doesn't make it feel easy to you. That makes it feel overwhelming and scary and like something's happening. And that is not a regulation or a compliance problem. That is an us problem as communicators to do better. So those are some of the things that, that we are doing uh, at Fifth Third Bank, but also at a lot of different banks in the U.S. and a lot more partnerships with community organizations um, to help give more people access. Great, Sebastian. I saw you uh, nodding uh, uh, quite. No, no. Uh, I I yeah, I will. I will. I think um, just supplement and maybe with a, a 
a short nuance on the uh, on the regulation bit. I agree with Melissa at the end, we can do a lot to simplify the language ourselves, but part of the complexity is also due to the um, the regulation, which impose also to, to banks, you know, to use, uh, you know, pre-contracted information, contractual information in a way which is indeed make things sometimes uh, uh, complex. Just to just to give you an example, we are discussing at European level now the um, you know the information sheet that you need to provide ahead of a consumer credit or uh, consumer loans or a mortgage credit. And well, this is actually a list of uh, I don't know how many um, you know items that you need to uh, in in a in a very uh, rigid way that you need to give to um, to consumers ahead of um, any 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 uh, contracting. So so really there is a bit of regulation. And that's also, I think, a discussion we need to have with regulators uh, going forward. No, um, going beyond this aspect, um, I, I fully agree that at the end, education, financial education is really key here. And it's more and more actually linked now to digital education, as we said, because um, the digitalization of financial services is indeed also pushing, I would say, or excluding those who are not um digitality digitally literate so it's create uh, other exclusions um and we advocate for for years i know in uk it has moved on um, in in the right direction but we advocate for years also in adding in the uh, school curriculum um more um financial education um aspect we, we we do not understand still that in many countries in europe and in the world in mean, financial education or at least part of it is is not um in the uh, school curriculum because that would help indeed uh, leveling up i would say the um, um well the education and the uh, the the, the, uh, the skills of um, uh, people from the young age so um, that's something we need to work all together uh, for, I believe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so just I want to pick up on a point uh, you made earlier. Um, uh, you know, we're talking about the, in the in the context of, of uh, bridging gender gaps, but what about other underserved parts of um, the population? Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing, what sort of developments you're seeing about how to uh, bridge those uh, inclusion gaps for, for other underserved um, parts of the population? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing that is helpful about technology, you know, there's so many different cuts of underserved and so many reasons and barriers to how people uh, struggle with their money and their finances. Uh, but, you know, on average, you know, building tools that give people control and transparency over their money, help them make financial progress, that's important for everyone. But if I just bring that to life on how that could work in an underserved mm -hmm. segment, you know, we recently did some research around ADHD. And we found that uh, people with ADHD on average were 1,600 pounds a year worse off than their peers. They were you know, three times more likely to struggle with debt and bill payments, twice as likely to suffer anxiety as a result of money management, and like less than one out of five felt that their banks or their financial providers were giving them the tools they needed to manage their lives successfully. That's you know a straightforward opportunity to offer them instant spending notifications, bill reminders, a place and structure way to put their money aside and protect their savings without a lot of cognitive load, just simple ways for them to become more empowered and manage their but their money better. And you can do that at scale digitally. That you know, that's a sliver of the population, and there's many slivers that all need to be addressed in different ways. And to do that, I think, you know, it's a million different decisions that you make in a company every day. So it really has to be kind of hard coded in your DNA and your mission and your culture, you know, the, it needs to be, you know, grassroots all the way up to the top in, in the values that you have in a business. And, you know, I think it's important to say you can't build inclusive products without inclusive teams. So, you know, companies need to include people from all backgrounds and communities and, and, and that reflect their customers to be able to, to make that work. It's a, it's a nice point to move on because I, I was very keen to talk about, um, uh, not only customers, but also employees uh, and, um, you know, improving financial inclusion, but also thinking about those both those groups. And um, Melissa, I don't know if you have any thoughts on on thinking about your your own employees as well as the customers when you're making these decisions. Yeah, I, it, it's a it's a challenge, actually, in a lot of in a lot of ways for for banks in the U.S., especially when you think about access to credit, it's very common that employees in, in any organization, if they are in 
um, the frontline facing customers, if they are working in operation centers and the call centers and places like that, um, they they are making it, at least in my company, they, they make they are making a living wage. We ensure and we've done a lot on minimum wage uh, well beyond what are our, our federal and our state limits at our company. Um, but you're but that doesn't mean that you have good credit. It doesn't mean it's easy for you to get access to a credit line or a mortgage loan so that you can buy a home um, and, and things of that nature. And so we, we spend a fair amount of time working to educate and we have gone back and forth as have other banks that I've worked at on do you have special access programs so that your employees can try your products as well and be part of it and then build up if they are in a new to credit or a credit repair situation um, so that they also have access to lending, especially in the U.S. It's such a big part of the consumer financial experience um, that if you don't have that, it can take you a lot longer to start to build toward what we often call here the American dream, right, of, of having a steady income and having a home and, and the security and safety of a home with food on the table on a regular basis. And so for us, focusing on the employees and informing them, educating them, and actually using them as focus groups, not just for their customer contact, for themselves as customers of ours. We also work hard, and we're doing this right now, to give our employees access to new products before they actually go out in the live market to all of our customers. And beyond just an alpha or a baby tester, actually being part of the first cohort of customers so that they can get to know our products better and feel feel more and more access to them. At the same time, it allows us to test if we're getting that simplified message and that better inclusion going. And it allows us to check on the accessibility front if, if there's places that we're missing where we just we somehow were not inclusive enough or had a blind side of, of sorts. And so we get a lot of feedback about how to do better on that. And we do our best to incorporate it as we go. That's great. It's good to hear. And, and Claire, I'd be really interested to hear about any insights from uh, mobile operators in, in in terms of their their customers, but also their employees and how they're they're trying to make those decisions work for both both cohorts. Yeah, I mean, I think the industry is, does look at it from both sides and and do a lot of efforts. Um, I would just sort of add something to you know. I just think that what we need also is we just need to be have a lot more data and be more data driven. So we've done, for example, research recently on um, persons with uh, disabilities. Um, you know, there's so many different types of disabilities, as was mentioned earlier. Um, but, you know, just there was just no data, you know, we uh, on, you know, how are people with disabilities accessing these digital and financial services? What are their barriers? And, you know, you know, it highlighted that, you know, while, for example, mobile with mobile, you have a lot of accessibility features built in if you have a smartphone, for example, but many just simply weren't even aware of them or products weren't being used for them. So I think I think it is about um, sense, having sensitization within the organization, but that sensitization also needs to be driven by, you know, the data of what is the reality on the ground, what are people's needs, what are the barriers that they're facing, you know, how how can we address them and without that and i just think there's unfortunately just a lack of insight and information on um the different groups who are currently excluded and and they are you know diverse and they have diverse needs and diverse barriers and um and i just think we just need to do better at getting that that those sort of insights into the businesses that so that we can address them I think if I would just build on that, you know, part of what you need in a company is that sort of co-creation ethos where you're really working alongside customers to address their needs. That is the best way to be able to figure out what their challenges are. And you just sparked a recollection of me, Claire, you know, when we were, when we were building Monzo, we brought in visually impaired customers into the offices and literally asked them, you know, what is it that's going to make this hard for you? And it led to an entire code redesign of, you know, building something that would work better with a screen reader and creating really simple copy paste elements for our card numbers for them to be able to engage online and digitally. And so the only way, you know, there's data, I agree, we need data, but there's also this version of just consistently talking to the groups and having that, if it's in your DNA as a company and you're consistently talking to customers, you know, that's what's going to spark the the bright ideas that that can be transformative. That's great. That's very interesting insight. Um, we talked a lot about um, bringing in uh, groups who have sort of traditionally been uh, excluded or, or, or not as included in um, financial services up to now. Um, I mean, as we move into more digital processes, use of, you know, APIs, digital wallets, mobile bank accounts, all that sort of stuff, 
What about, um, are we creating more barriers for people who are predominantly cash users, people who, who don't necessarily use technology in that way, who are, um, you know, hesitant about using banking apps, um, who don't understand how, uh, uh, you know, a, a virtual wallet might work? Um, how do we make sure that we're not alienating those people uh, from the banking sector of the future? And it's, it's quite a broad question. So um, I'd be keen to hear from all of you, but maybe uh, Sebastian, it'd be good to get your thoughts uh, initially on that. Well, it's an interesting question. Of course, the um, use and, and development from some of APIs, um, also in Europe in the context of the PSD2, which has allowed more players to enter into the market, so increased competition. Um, well, and, and perhaps indeed uh, support to a certain extent further financial inclusion, although I don't think it was the, um, the prime objective of, of, of such a technology. Uh, um, the, um, how can I say, I, I, I think, yes, the, the risk is a bit the same risk as, as, as we mentioned before, for those who are indeed not digi digitally literate, that you, you, you may uh, exclude them. Uh, one, one part of the population that we, we didn't speak uh, yet about is, of course, the more elderly people, um, which I believe need to be uh, particularly targeted also or accompanied into this um, um, digital in, into this digital uh, journey again through a dedicated uh, program on, on financial uh, education, digital um, um, education. No. If, if you, if you, I'm not yet sure. Also, we can fully oppose, you know, the um, um, cashless and, and, and cash society. In in our view, what we see is that, uh, although we would be uh, supporting more a more cashless society uh, from the from a bank's point of view, uh, we we see actually that, I mean. Well, the, the, the use of cash is, is, is generally decreasing, but it, it will remain, I think, for, for some times. And actually, it's seen also um, by, by some people and by some authorities also still as, an, as a financial inclusion tool, especially for those people who are perhaps not fully um, uh, digitally uh, literate or for, perhaps for, for, for other, 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 other reasons. So... Again, there is no one, I think, response to, to, to your question. I think, again, education is, is a very important. I like what was said about the partnership because, you know, financial education should be targeted, should be uh, tailor-made uh, to the, um, the communities you try to, 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 um, to help and support. Uh, but, but uh, again, I, I, to a certain extent, unfortunately, I strongly believe that cash will also remain... Um, as a, as, a, as a residual um, way for, for some times. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Melissa, maybe get your thoughts on this. Sure. Um, I, I do worry that you know, there, there's a lot of, first, there's a lot of greatness to, to digital wallets and to the ability to move money, especially real time. There's pro processing efficiencies for institutions, for the banking system overall, as well as for individuals to get money to and from um, people, as, as Claire said earlier, right, we're seeing more and more um, folks that not just use it to make a payment, but also to save money, to, to send money to more, more and different bodies. And that's great. But there are uh, many, many people that live in a completely cash society. Um, and so continuing to put more things in places where they may or may not have access to that and require them, at least in, in some products, this is not true across the world, but some products still require you to have access to a bank account that you tie to that um, from, a, from a payment rail situation, right? Or tie it to a debit card or, or some type of prepaid card. And so in certain places, that's not the case in the world. And, and some places have been far ahead on that. In other places, it is. And so that can create even more of that split that we talked about in terms of the inclusion gap of people who have access to financial services. The other thing is, I think you need to back up as, as, a, as a bank, as an institution, as, as folks that are in this industry and say, what is the actual problem we're solving for? What is the job that that 
individual consumer or that small business is trying to get done. And so while we might think it's great to get rid of cash or to reduce cash um, for safety, for security, for other reasons, and that's true, right? I mean, when at the at the previous bank that I was at, Citigroup, we certainly had done a lot in in Africa uh, with with mobile devices and and really making sure on a lot of the rural routes that people were making deliveries uh, to various to various places that they were in a safe and secure situation. You see a lot of places that pick up cash as they make deliveries, even in the U.S. Still, so there is safety, there's security, there's ease of processing, but starting with what's the problem we're solving and making sure it doesn't just help an institution or a system, but it also helps those individuals and doesn't then remove access, which is part of what you asked Owen is, are we actually possibly causing a greater divide? And I think with certain populations we are, and that's why always starting with that job to be done is, is the way that I believe more and more of us should focus. Great, thank you. Um, so Josh, it'd be great to get your, your thoughts on that too. I mean, yeah, living in the UK, um, it's stark how little cash is left in society, right? And the pandemic really drove an acceleration of that. The use of cash really sharply declined. Contactless, which was already pretty highly penetrated in the UK, has become the default with the higher payment limits that have been enabled. And we've seen, you know, accelerated innovation and adoption of digital payments, both online and in store. So, you know, our focus really has to be, I think, building off what Melissa said, is like making sure that what we're doing is actually driving real hard benefits, both the tangible, um, the functional and the emotional. So that, you know, it's not just about moving money more quickly or more cheaply, that it's really that, you know, the benefits of the digital economy are realized. So people can have greater visibility, greater control over their money, and they're better off as a result of engaging digitally. So things like, you know, instant spend notifications, notifying you of upcoming bills, automatic roundups to, you know, help you save pots, which help you separate your money and lock it away, tools that, you know, let you categorize your spend and insights and trends into that are all important because uh, there needs to be a hard and tangible benefit to to that migration to make it more seamless for people. You know, similarly for businesses, and Melissa said, there, you know, there is great benefit to to, to both sending money more efficiently, but more effectively, we see that with our small businesses, with things like e-invoicing, for example, they have better working cash flow and they get paid seven days earlier. So, you know, there's some hard things that you can do and you set your bar at a higher level to make sure that it is a net benefit to people. I think it's also about reducing the barriers to access, which we talked about earlier, and the emotional um, barriers or the anxiety around money. So making sure that digital money is a delightful and interactive experience. It's not the only thing that's become digital now, right? Most people are living their lives more in a digital and connected way. So whether money helps you split your bill after a meal or share expenses with flatmates or even, you know, send emojis to say thank you after someone's paid you back, those are all ways that you can sort of start to stay connected into, into people's lives and, and create both the rational and the emotional satisfiers. And, and I think just building off of what one of the other speakers was saying around age, I don't think that there are age barriers to digital engagement. I think we have over 300 customers right now that are in their 90s. So, you know, if you do it well and you make it simple and you reduce the barriers to access and you provide the right benefits and, you know, to Melissa's point, solve the jobs to be done uh, in a compelling way, I, I think you can create, you know, a, a great virtuous cycle around access and benefit. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a few uh, minutes left for some we're getting some good questions coming through. So I'd be um, let's give some time to answer those. I had one. Um, what are financial institutions doing to respond to the uh, cost of living crisis, um, which we are you know very much starting to um, see come through? Um, would anyone like to um, talk about what you're seeing either at your own institution or you're seeing in the industry? Um, some of the responses that uh, are helping. Uh, certainly those customers who um, have previously or, or, or groups that have been previously been uh, excluded from financial services, what are you doing to, to help those um, through this, this period? So I'm happy to start. I think we, we yeah, have a broad gambit of everything from, you know, how we're communicating to our customers, making sure that in a sensitive time, we're thoughtful about what we're communicating, what products and services we're offering to them. We've raised the bar on understanding and identifying vulnerability and providing support for vulnerable customers. Uh, we have some really interesting features that we unveiled in the pandemic that we are continuing to, to grit. Um, great use of now things like a share with us button where somebody can confidentially 
reach out to us within the app and share and disclose to us whether they're having a difficult time, you know, victim of spousal abuse or struggling with their debt or, or um, challenges, you know, mental health challenges. And that allows us to be able to provide more bespoke services and offerings and compassion um, and support for those customers. So those are some of the things that we're doing. We also have to um, look internally and take care of our employees that are struggling with the cost of living crisis. So, you know, we have unveiled some one-off payments around uh, the energy bills for some of our uh, lower lower earning employees to make sure that we're doing what we can to take care of them in a difficult time and also providing them with access to our money management tools, et cetera, that, that should be able to benefit them and allow them to make the most of their money. Those are just some examples. Yeah, no, that's good, good ones. Uh, Melissa, I saw you making notes. Now, if you're going to steal some of those ideas for yourselves, yeah. but uh, and, and is there anything you'd like to share? Well, first, I'm, I'm definitely going to uh, co co copy, which I think is the form, found a form of flattery on the share with us, just in terms of, um, you know, ad additional access, whether it's for financial needs or, or otherwise. That's a fantastic idea. And certainly, um, I'm very unfortunately, and, and not a banking thing, but we, we during the pandemic in every country saw increases in, um, you know, in situations where people who were in domestic abuse or other or, or other types of abuse were having a hard time getting help, right? Because they couldn't get away from, from their situation given that they were locked in. So I, I'm taking that one just outright. I'm telling you that now, Sujata. So thank you for that. No um, problem. <laughs> yeah, I would actually say, <laughs> coming actually all the way back to something Claire shared uh, earlier about what we're seeing people do in digital, we're very focused at Fifth Third on what we just call the everyday banking needs, right? People need a place and, and um, all of us have said it in different ways. You need a way to get paid, right? And if it's not cash, like, and, and hopefully we can get you better and easier access to that paycheck. You need a way to pay other people or other institutions if it's bills or, or otherwise, right? You need a way to have access to short-term liquidity, right? Maybe you're getting paid on Friday and you're at the market today. Um, and so it's only Tuesday. And how do I cover that without having to, you know, not have what I need on the table for the week? Um, or maybe there's an emergency that came up. And as Claire said, while we're seeing people start to save using some of the digital tools, um, we certainly have a long way to go, at least in the United States. Over 50% of Americans do not have uh, a few hundred U.S. dollars in their bank account if they had an emergency, like, um, you know, their car needed to be repaired so that they could uh, keep driving to work, right? And 50 to 60% of Americans during the pandemic, we, we see on a monthly basis, um, are making a decision about what bills to pay, right? Can I pay every bill? What bill will I pay? And so when you look at that, we focus a lot then on that everyday banking need. And we focus a, a fair amount on how do we give you early access to your paycheck. We got to give an example of that earlier. Um, as soon as we know that it's going to come in from in the United States with the, the clearinghouse, we actually give you access to it right away, immediately. If that's on Wednesday for a Friday payday, great. The money is yours. It's there for you, right? We have a product that we've introduced called My Advance that lets you borrow from your future self. If you have a digital direct deposit coming in regularly, we know you're a safe bet. We know that's going to be coming in, and we'll go ahead and let you borrow and take an advance on that. And several other products where we actually try to give you better and easier access to your own money. Um, so that we can help you through those times and not um, have you go to other places, which might be much less affordable for you. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, we're actually coming very close to the end of our session, but Sebastian, um, if you'd like to... No, no, no. Uh, I, ju I just wanted to say that uh, the, the, the issue of cost of, um, of of living crisis is very high on the agenda of the uh, of many um, national banking association where we're discussing it, and, and many initiatives have already been taken at, at local level, and most likely more should be, or will will be done. Uh, well, some you know local uh, or, or communities have agreed on some kind of moratoria for more vulnerable people, so helping people to postpone some of the uh, repayment of their debt, um, as 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 we did also during the pandemic. Um, some some banks are looking indeed also at uh, the more vulnerable customers whether they should also adjust you know um, fees uh, etc. So so there, there are many many um, initiatives ongoing and discussion ongoing. It's it's just to mention that it's of course a very very difficult situation for for all of us, including by the way uh, the banks themselves who have to be. Um, uh, cautious in the sh in in the sense that you know well the, the assets 
quality uh, of banks could also, of course, deteriorate in the future as well. With uh, uh, so we need to be to be to be cautious. But this is something which is high on the agenda. That's what, that's what I wanted to mention. Absolutely. Um, well, li listen. I'm, I'm sorry, Claire. We've, we've come to the end of the session. Um, and it, unless you have anything uh, very quick to say on on what you're seeing in in uh, among mobile operators and, and how they're responding. No. Okay. Um, well, listen, we, we have come to the end of the session. That's really flown by, but I want to thank all of you. It was a really fascinating talk. I think we've, we've uh, sort of all learned a lot about um, what various uh, companies are doing to, to help uh, customers in this really tricky time. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank you, my panelists. It's been really insightful and, and interesting. Um, I'd also like to remind the audience, uh, thank you for your questions. I'm sorry, sorry we didn't get a chance to get through all of them. Uh, that the session is available for 30 days to be able to watch again on demand on the Banking Revolution website. And that all that remains to be said is goodbye. Thank you very much.